I am. It's a show that's been furloughed for 18 months, which is a very odd experience for a performer because I'll be honest with you, you get your mojo up, you know, you get all going and excited and you think this is what I want to talk about. It's really important. And then someone says, yeah, you have to leave it now for 18 months and then do it again. It feels weird. But I did do some warm ups the other day. And the show still seems to be working. It's about social media. It's about the madness and rage and craziness of social media. And that is at least, I think, still relevant as it was 18 months ago, possibly more relevant. You do poke the beast on Twitter, don't you? Yeah, I quite like doing that. I, the thing is that when it first started, and, you know, you've probably had experience a bit as well, of people being nasty to you on social media and decided that's what the thing, uh, that's the greatest thing about social media, the chance to upbraid people you've never liked. I didn't follow the law, which was don't feed the trolls. And the reason I didn't do that is that I've had long experience in comedy clubs of uh, people called hecklers. And what they are are people who shout abuse at you at the dark, for, for, mainly for their own reasons, because they enjoy upsetting people and hurting people. And the way you deal with that is to try and make it funny. You don't ignore it. And I do that on social media to the best of my ability. I don't ignore it. I screenshot the abuse and then I try and say something funny above it. And that was the beginning of the show, really, is to say, let's see if instead of making all this, leaving all this hate to fester or just getting really upset about it, let's see if we can make it funny. And the whole yeah. show in a way is a cry for comedy. It's like saying, is there a way in which comedy, which is very under scrutiny at the moment, and people get very angry about everything, very angry about jokes and whatever. Let's just see if there's a way of sort of being funny that won't just upset people. Yeah, I mean, I, I do get a lot of abuse on Twitter as well, as you know, because we follow each other on Twitter. Yeah. But, you know, when people are particularly rude to me, saying how rubbish I am at my job and how I should go away and die and blah, 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 I usually put over the top of that, is that you, son? And that tends <laughs> to make people, um, you know, go away and leave me alone for a little while. Um, yeah. <laughs> you talk about your dad on Twitter quite a lot, don't you? Yeah, well, yeah, I do, actually. I mean, because part of what I try and do... See, I'm a very, um, I'm an absurdly open person. I was thinking about this the other day in terms of my wife, who is an absurdly private person. I sort of wonder how we ever managed to get that together. But I am, I just have to put everything about my life uh, out there. I've always done that. I've always done that in comedy. I did a whole show about, um, before this show, about my mum, my late mother's sex life and my dad's dementia. Uh, and what I noticed was that if you, you know, put that out in a certain way, then people really respond to it. Because there's lots of people in the same situation as me who have got a, a living relative living with dementia. And I try and do it in a way that feels, again, kind of, it's the same thing, you know, how can we take something that's dark and difficult and make it in a way joyful? So I try and put photos of my dad when he's smiling and he's upbeat and, you know, and he's not always like that, but there are times when he is. And it seems to really touch people and I'm glad about that, really. And also I just want my dad who is a really funny bloke, despite everything, to sort of feel like he's still in contact with the world. Yeah, you're writing a memoir, aren't you, about your dad? Uh, it's about my dad and my mum. It's basically based on that show that I just... I did that show before this show, which is about, which is called Trolls Not The Dolls. I did a show called My Family Not The Sitcom, because I've got this brand that means something only to me, which is called My Show's Not The Something. And I did a show for two years in the West End and all over the world, actually, called My Family Not The Sitcom, which was about my mum's sex life. My mum had a very long affair with a golfing memorabilia salesman and went on to become obsessed with golf. Uh, and that was part of the show. And the other part of the show was about my dad's dementia uh, and the way I deal with it and the way I've managed to find comedy out of it uh yeah I mean it's just something that I like to do I've always dealt with stuff dealt with stuff in my life through comedy and as you get older some of that stuff gets more difficult and that doesn't stop me dealing with it in the same way how was how funny was it not winning the euros I was used to it <laughs> do you know what I mean uh that yeah. song that I believe you may know and that people may have heard during that tournament. One thing it does do, it prepares you for the disappointment because it's got lines in it about all oh, those oh-so-nears and, you know, basically it's a song about how we never win. That's what that song is about. Even though we sing it when England are win winning, it's a song really about how we never win. And so the good thing about that is, you know, I was sort of prepared for it. I, you know what? It was a great competition, great tournament. I was really pleased with the way the team, you know, put themselves out there. I think we played incredibly well in the recent games, uh, fantastically, I thought, uh, against Hungary. And so onwards and upwards. <laughs> what was it like when you were actually at Wembley for the final? Um, because you were there with Mr Skinner as well, of course. And I'm sure everybody wanted to have pictures taken with you and shake your hands and the like. Yeah, well, that's... 
a given, I think, when we go to football, and it's really, really nice. I'll be honest with you, actually, I think the biggest game for me and Frank in that tournament was not the final, but it was the Germany game for our personal reasons, because in 1996, when that song first came out, uh, Frank, I remember, was always banging on about how this is our perfect summer uh, and it's going to be incredible and England are going to win that tournament and the song's going to be sung everywhere. Uh, and it was sung everywhere, but we didn't win that tournament. Germany beat us uh, in the semi-final, and there are shots you can still find on YouTube of me and Frank with ex-girlfriends standing in the at Wembley looking upset. Uh, and so the fact that we were there 25 years later to see England finally beat Germany, and then the song was sung, that felt like a huge narrative redemptive art for me and Frank Skinner. <laughs> 